So my name is Sid Freitag. Uh, I'm with Do It Academic Technology. This is a session in the Teaching Effectively in Canvas series. Is there anyone who has not yet been to one of these sessions? Okay, uh, welcome. We have four uh, sessions. Uh, this is individual learning, social learning, assessment, and designing course design. All right. So teaching effectively in Canvas, the individual learning edition. So here's two words you hear a lot on campus, active learning. So just kind of a free response exercise. What comes to your mind when I say active learning? Like what's, what does active learning look like, sound like? What, anybody just shout out an example. Active learning, what is it? Groups. Okay. Ask Noisy. questions. What would? Noisy. Okay, noisy. Collaboration. Okay, good. Engagement. Good. Questions. Questions? Okay, good, good, good stuff. Um, so a lot of times when people promote active learning or even when I have to make a website or a flyer promoting active learning, I look for pictures like this. And it's students interacting with each other, discussions, collaboration, or this back and forth with the instructor, asking questions, getting feedback in real time. And those are good, those are good things. And I also wanna propose the idea that pictures like this can also be active learning. So someone, so you can be reading a, you can be reading a book in a way that's pretty passive, like your eyeballs are going over the words on the page or you can be reading a book in a way that's more <coughs> active, like imagining a dialogue with the, with the author, arguing with the author, uh, summarizing in your own words. So uh, there are a number of techniques that work that, uh, for active learning, for engagement, for deep thinking that students can do on their own. Uh, and so that's what we're gonna try to focus on today and thinking about how can Canvas be a tool that helps you in that and helps you help your students in that as well. So, so one way uh, to, to just try to articulate some of what an act, act, active or more active kind of activities could be that students uh, are doing is just a little bit of theory. Um, there's an educational researcher, Mickey Chi, who wrote a paper um, where she broke down, uh, created a model of just the three parts here, the active, constructive, and interactive categories to think about learning. And in this, in this slide, so this is on page two of your handout, and just a short summary table. But some of what she talks about is that can you observe students do, are students doing something? So I could be reading a book like this, and I might be very active in my head, but if I'm doing so, let's say I'm highlighting, or I'm writing notes in the margin, that's more observable. So it's not to say that I can't be active without highlighting, but in just, in her model, that's a, that's a feature that she might look, might, rec might suggest you look for, is what, what people are doing. Uh, it gets more, more complicated than that, but if you're interested in going deeper, there's a link to the uh, reference to the paper. And in this model, uh, which is just shortened and, and expanded a little, it's also contract contrasted with what might be passive. So let's say I'm lecturing up front for an hour and people are just sitting there going like this. Um, they might be receiving information and storing it, hopefully. And that's just at a certain level. But then if we take a level up, there might be opportunities where I can activate their prior knowledge, like saying, okay, now remember back to when you experienced something like such and such and you're thinking, and then that connects to what we're gonna lecture about. Or can think, help think about making connections, how to integrate what we're talking about with what, with what we're learning in a bigger picture. So that bumps can bump up, take a bump up. And what she calls constructive is builds on that and getting to where you're making, you students are making more inferences, making, doing more to make the connections, uh, doing just a deeper, another level of thinking. 
And then interactive in her model is similar to constructive, but then it involves someone else or something else like, a, like an intelligent tutor. So that's just the very simple run through of, of a potential way to think about active learning and how an activity could be made more active or, or just how it could be designed. And for the demos uh, and examples that we can focus on today, focus most on today, probably more in this active and constructive area, a little bit into passive, potentially into interactive, but most of the examples are gonna land in the middle. Um, so another, another way to think about learning and how to make it more active is if you think about your experts in your field. So you not only have a lot of content knowledge, you've got a lot of experience and if there's a new piece of content in your field, you can say, aha, this is like this other thing, it's not like this. So it's not just bits of knowledge, it's those connections and efficiencies that you've developed around your field about making these connections. <coughs> and, and there's th uh, ways of thinking that you've internalized. You don't have to sit and think about how things connect. They can just happen. Your students aren't there yet. They might be more like this. Uh, maybe they've got some bits of knowledge that might be correct, might be incorrect, and maybe they've got some, some level of connection, but nothing nothing like uh, that other diagram. So part of teaching and designing these uh, learning activities, there's ways to think about it that there are bits of knowledge and content, uh, but then there's also ways you can contextualize and frame the content and what students are doing with it to help, help them build those connections. Sometimes it might mean making those connections obvious. They're obvious to you, but the students might need that prodding more than once to say this connects to this in this way and because, and it influences that. Uh, so some of the examples, uh, demos I've got could, could be some ways, some small ways that you could help do that. Any questions, comments so far? Because I'm gonna send you back to working at your tables again soon. All right. So one more thing to think about for course design is that when, when I was in school, this is how I thought of my classes, that there were times when I went to class at a time and place, and then there was this stuff I did out of class, uh, homework, studying for tests, and this was a category, this was a big, big category that blurred together. There is a way, uh, a, mo a model that could help, help frame the activities just a little different and this could be a design tool for you and a way of communicating to your students that I'm, let's say, I'm assigning you to read chapter seven before class and I want you to pay attention because I want you to gain this vocabulary and then in class, I'm gonna use that vocabulary to show examples and compare and contrast ways of looking at these examples. And you need that vocabulary in order to make sense of what I'm gonna talk about in class. We talk about in class. And then after class, you're going to apply that vocabulary to do some comparing and contrasting on new examples. So that might be an example of a flow of how students do things out of class, before and after, that blend with what you do in class. And so this is a pack, this is more obviously a package that the pieces connect. And so that way, it's got more of a chance of not just being this big blur of all the things I do outside of class, if I do them. And so also, hopefully, best case scenario, if students realize the, important, the value of these, they do them. And so now, um, back to thinking about your course and what you might like to see made better in a little more detail um, that, we, that can help drive some of what we give do for the demos is page three of your handout. And this is where 
I mean, think more specifically about one, what's something you do in class that can be really powerful and valuable if the students have prepared. And there might be some aspect of maybe there's something students do afterwards as well to help integrate. So <coughs> we'll take about, um, we'll take quite a bit of time for this to think about it and talk about it in your groups and this can help drive what we show for the demos later. So just uh, get about five, five or so minutes to think and make your own notes and then go back to talking at your tables. And we'll take it from there. <coughs> so, so hopefully like you've had some good everybody discussions everybody and they've helped prompt some that's ideas that's of that's what you that's might that's want that's to that's try that's in your course or, or that you might want to see demo in Canvas to try to help get at, at what you'd like to have made better. Um, I've got some, can we can start with some can demos and then during the break I can look at, uh, we can look at what's, uh, anything you've added to that Google sheet and see what we can do uh, in, in the time. But the rest of today is going to be pretty much driven by what you're interested in and what we can demonstrate in the, in the confines of the time and what we know how to do. Uh, but just to get started, here's some like 10, 10 easy relatively easy ideas of ways Canvas uh, can be a tool uh, that can help facilitate individual learning. And some of these, most of these I have, have, web, have pages for, or I can make one fairly quickly. So anybody who wants to shout out something from this list, uh, we, can, we can jump there for the demo, and then other demos could come later. Yes, Maria. Oh, uh, designing a pathway with pages and forms. The very last one. Ah, that's a little takes a little too much. I, no, I mean, you can do it. I can talk through it. Um, who's who's been familiar with uh, CSCR, Case Scenario Critical Reader Builder? Okay. So one of the things that that helps. Uh, an instructor design is kind of a, a pathway through some content and an application and I mean, whatever you put into it, it could be straight content or it could be knowledge checks or self-reflection. So there's some uh, combination of probably text, images, and then something for students to do. It's like, here, read this scenario. You are in a hospital. You are a doctor. Here is this patient. What do you do? and then multiple choice question, A, B, C, D, and you get some feedback on how, you, how you've responded, and then some other thing happens, so there's a pathway. And CSCR, if it's uh, not going to be supported officially, and so we're interested in ways that how can the tools we do have help, help you design some of that, some of what people have been doing in CSCR, which is like a, path, a pathway here, Look at this. Read, read it. Look at the picture. Some audio, video. Now, some choice. Some app, Some way of applying sim simply, quickly, usually through some interactive form. Um, and now, based on that, what happens? So, I can work <coughs> on that during the break. <laughs> um, but it's that, that idea that we, we don't have like this magic thing that does the same thing CSCR does, but if you think more abstractly about what's the experience, what's the linear, slightly branching experience I want students to have, and can other tools do some of that? Um, you pick the hardest one. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, <laughs> any easier ones? <laughs> yeah, uh, got a couple. The Kaltura? Okay. Um, does, every, does people know what Kaltura is? Uh, it's like YouTube for campus. So if you've got videos uh, and you've got the actual video file, Kaltura is a place where you can put the host the file and then link to it in Canvas. And Kaltura also has the capability to put in these little quizzes, little, little multiple choice kind of quick self-knowledge self checks. And I do have an example of that. You could put um, actual YouTube videos and things in there. You can do that too, yep. All right, so for an example of a 
Okay, go to mod. So I'm back in the teaching effectively in Canvas course and in modules I've got a chunk called individual learning examples. And okay. So here what I've got is uh, this video is is stored in Kaltura and we'll watch and uh, you see I've embedded it in a Canvas page. And because it's in a Canvas page and it's not just a link to a video, I've got the option of putting some context around it. Um, so I can say, as you watch this video, think about such and such we did. Watch for instances of such and such. And then come to class and we'll talk about such and such. Um, but for the, all right, so it's telling me, gonna be at a quiz. I don't know where my volume is. Um, it's, it's very introductory information. So James Paul G, who had been a, who's a researcher of games and learning, who was here and is now at another university, is introducing a series of short videos about princi learning principles that are in games. Um, and so now the video stopped and I've asked this question based on what he talked about. So it's that immediate application, so it's just that immediate use of having to remember something he said. So this isn't, this isn't a deep probing question, but it is, was I paying attention? And I have to reach back into my mind and try to remember that. The, the, the question is not embedded in the video itself, right? You, did you add it in, in, the, in Kaltura with the video? Yes, okay. Kaltura, right. I had the plain video and then Kaltura gives you uh, some tools and an interface to like stop the uh -huh. video and say, insert this question okay. here. What I've been told is that there's, I've uh, recently heard that, that there's a word limit okay. to what you can have here. So they're not deep probing complex questions but it is more that immediate self-knowledge check uh, feedback. Does that go to the grade book at all? I've seen a knowledge-based document that seems to indicate it can. Okay. I haven't tried it. Um, the last I heard, there were some issues with it, but sometimes it works. Okay. So <laughs> it's not quite there yet, but I know Caltura is constantly developed. Right. And in fact, the guy that used to be here is now working at Caltura, so hopefully some of these issues will get mm -hmm. elevated there. <laughs> right, right. So probably the best use of it is just the, for a, a tool for the students that, that self-check. <coughs> so if I, if I can't answer that question, I, hopefully it gives me an indication I could go back and watch that section. Yes? A, a faculty member I'm working with also uses it um, for prediction questions, so not only oh. do I remember Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's a great technique. It's that way I have this investment in thinking about what, what's going to happen. Um, especially I've heard in like physics education. If I'm going to push a little wooden car across, the, across a platform with a certain amount of force, how far will the car go? Have people predict and then do it. And you can see what happens. Um, so that's where I've heard other instances that kind of Technique, but I, I like that. Does it do open? It doesn't open open though, right? Just multiple choices. I do not remember. I don't remember the choices. Yeah. Either. Yeah, they're not. It's some of them are yeah, yeah, they're not as sophisticated as something like a, an actual quizzing tool. Mm -hmm. You get find. Into hot water if you put those kind of open ended ones. If, if you're looking to give a feedback yeah. response, right. correct or incorrect. Yeah. But you could embed the video in the quiz tool of Canvas and then ask questions yep. instead of that. That would be that. Yep. Yeah. And then you could actually grade them and have them in there. So. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, because this is embedded in a Canvas page, I could have maybe some more content down here. And it says, now that you've watched the video, write, uh, write a reflection about something. Um, mm -hmm. So because it's in this page, it's not just a link to a video, I've got all those opportunities to put some ancillary content around it. Another video, um, link to a quiz. 
So this is something that students could do for prep work, uh, especially if you have the videos mm -hmm. and the self-knowledge check and built in. FYI, we just were at the Canvas conference yesterday. They're making huge improvements to their quizzing tool that will be amazing. That's so you might, you know, might have more options. Yeah. That video, do all sorts of interesting things. Did they, did they give an estimated time of arrival for that? July 22nd is what some guy yelled at. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The running yeah. joke. Around and they were like, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Just yeah. over the hill. Summer. Summer. Probably yeah. like summer. Any day now. <laughs> but, uh, so one, one, yes. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I saw you again before. A, um, a quick question about where you were, and it showed modules, pages, et cetera. Mm -hmm. you, as an instructor, you can see that, but we as students, we can't see that, so, right? You we should be able to, to no. I thought the module is turned off. Yeah. Oh, I thought I turned it on, I'm sorry. The, okay, the module is turned on. It's the button. Uh, you have to go to settings and open up the navigation link. Oh, the, mo okay. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Learning, learning yeah. moment. Um, Okay, so in your course, you've got that option to control the navigation of what students can or can't click on directly. Uh, and it's in under settings in the navigation tab. So I will drag, so right now, uh, modules is under the thing that's hidden. I'm going to drag it here. So now modules should be visible. And I have to remember to save. So thank you for pointing that out. It's because when you're the instructor, you can see all of it. So it makes it a little. You have to rem think or get feedback uh, on what you've actually made available. But, but thank you. It's also the student view. Yes, it is. You have to remember to do it. Especially if you think you if you're certain that you did this, and then why should I go look at that? But yes, that was a, that was a great teaching moment. Thank you. Um, Okay, uh, before the break, uh, any other uh, one of these examples uh, that you'd like to see? Wiki page? Okay. So who, okay, a wiki page is really similar to a Canvas content page. And I'll, I'll make one. And we can actually test it for those of you who are logged in and to see if it really works as advertised. So if I'm making, um, let's say I'm going to make a new page. So I'm, I'm, I clicked on the plus button and the module that I want to make the page in, and I make a content page, and I'll make a new page. And the difference between a content page and what we're calling a wiki page is that for the wiki page, the students can edit. Uh, for just straight content, only the instructor. <coughs> so I'm going to name it, type in here. And there it is down, uh, down at the bottom of my module. And I'll go to here. And I will edit it. Stuff to this page. Down here uh, in the options, who can edit this page? So I'm going to change it to teachers and students, and I'll save. And I'll go back to my modules, and I need to publish it so that you can see it. And publishing is just, does it have a green cloud or a gray cloud? Uh, so there I published it. So I'm curious, is anyone following along? And can you get to that page and can you type in it? I just made pages visible on the navigation thing so we can now see it. Thank you, John. <laughs> you should have been able to access it through there. Yep. Oh yeah, that's true. Go to yeah. yeah, because I because I put a link to it under the module heading. Yeah, I just added it. Okay, all right, let's go look. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. And I don't know who wrote that Somebody either. Else wrote it. That's interesting. I, it, it looks anonymous. Mm -hmm. You probably have to refresh. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 
So what might be some applications uh, that you'd see for having a page like this uh, in your course uh, available to students? Well, I'm thinking about glossaries. Okay. And, and having them do terms and, and you know, and, and like track them to sources. Like crowdsourcing a glossary. Okay. Allison. So um, one potential limitation that I've noticed with this is that I just went back in to edit again, and I had put in this question about, I wonder how this works. Um, and then I'm in it again, and that comment is gone. And I've been in classes where my edits disappeared. So I would um, say whatever it is should be pretty low stakes. OK, good point. Um, I would really recommend this is a problem. Multiple people cannot edit a wiki page at a time right. in Canvas, ah. which makes it kind of a terrible wiki. It's not like Google Docs. It's not like Google Docs. Right. The solution is just embed a Google Doc Google or have a link to a Google page because that yeah. does that mm -hmm. so very much better. Yeah. And then you can have people, you can track to see who said hello everyone and who wrote that nasty comment up there. Uh, we right. can't, I don't, I don't know how easy it is to track that here. I am not seeing anything that makes it clear. Yeah. So that's like John, if you click on the cog in the top right, you oh. can see the page history. There's page history. Figuring out who yeah. wrote what, which is, I mean, which is good. It's because it's not necessarily about the tool. It's about what you want to have happen or not have happen, and does the tool give you what you want? And in this case, I think we found a number of the limitations that it has. So if you wanted something like a crowdsource glossary, or this would be kind of students creating content uh, and potentially critiquing one another, you can think about the pros and cons of this tool versus something like embedding a Google Doc. Yes, Can Julie. you show um, what it would look like to add a Google Doc as a link in the modules? You know what I mean? Sure. Um, we'll go. Uh, so here's this Google Doc that is editable by anyone who has the link. Uh, and I see you've been, been adding some. Um, so let's say that I, I say the Canvas wiki page just isn't going to do it for me. I want a Google Doc instead. Um, I can do that. So one way I could do it is to add a link to the Google Doc. I, ha I copied its URL. So I went to the module. I clicked the plus add something. And I'm going to add an external URL. I'm going to paste in my Google Doc link. <coughs> and I will give this very unimaginative <laughs> title. <laughs> so there it is. And I publish it. And so now it's uh, kind of, it's, it's embedded-ish. Um, but I can see that it's a thing, it's a document within my document. <coughs> and so now I can see who's <laughs> typing. <laughs> yes. Yep. Nice. You can type from there. <laughs> right, so that's another option to achieve a similar, a similar kind of purpose. And this is also where you can think about, well, what, 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 is, what value is this serving? Like what? What are students doing? Why are they doing it? How does it blend? Uh, interact with other things. This is one of the easiest ways to let students collate and collect, curate images, because you can just copy from anywhere and paste an image into a Google Doc. So if you want them to collect visual examples of things, whether on their camera running around campus or on the internet, you know, as they surf around, they can just, you know. 
uh, right click, copy image, and then in Google Doc, paste image, write up a little thing around it, and boom, they've got their example of <laughs> whatever first concept, an image example of that. Right. It's much easier than trying for students to try to upload stuff, images in Canvas on their own. Can you, you repeat that? It's easier to upload images in here or in In Canvas? Google Docs, yeah. if you have a Google Doc, yeah. That's what I thought. The, yeah. the image upload for students in Canvas is really terrible. It's not so bad for instructors, but it's really terrible for, for students, mm -hmm. unless they're in a group space. If you put them in a group space, then it's as easy as uh, as it is for instructors, which is still not as easy as Google Docs. Right. And, and that means that it would be private to the class. So, like, I use Sifter. Yep. Sifter's public. Right. So if, if students want to do something like collect profane uh, graffiti, yep. Google Docs would, in, in the course would be better. Right. Google Docs does not allow you to do the geotagging that Sifter does, so. Right. And, you know, so I didn't have to click edit. Uh, I don't have to hit refresh to see to see what's happening. Ruth, Google Maps would let you do that. And you can Private. embed Google Maps in here as well. Yeah. And that, really, and that would be Well, that, it's, you can put put pictures next to, on the map, wherever you want Because I always right. have to warn them not to do it illegal upsetting activities. <laughs> 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 on, on a private Google map that you set up for to share with them, not a, you know, don't share it with the community. Yeah, it's kind of like a thing, uh, not not very well known aspect of Google Maps is that you can make your own, it's like a la annotated layer over the map. Yes. Um, so, uh, so we're going to take a break. Uh, Ten minute break. All right. Um, so, being responsive to a question that was asked earlier about paths, um, one thing I forgot that now I remember is uh, as a very simple way of kind of controlling student access to content, you can do a thing with modules that you lock, a module is locked until a certain condition is met, such as a date happens or a student gets a certain grade, a passing grade on it, they get at least an 80 on such and such quiz. So that's a simplistic level of paths. Uh, and I want to introduce, we work with, Zach worked on this during the break. Uh, this is Zach Schwaller. Schwaller. Who has recently joined our office at Do It Economic Technology and he's working specifically on how to do some of the more advanced kind of content and interaction things in Canvas. And Zach, during the break, uh, very graciously made a little demo of something that, that can help be a little more sophisticated use of paths and mastery of content before students can, or paths that change based on how students answered something. So Hi guys. Go for it. Um, so obviously it was like five minutes, so it's not very advanced or whatever, but it kind of just like answers the question of like, um, you know, uh, making that content available as you proceed. So right now, Mastery Paths is mostly just associated with points. So when you're going in and you're making a quiz, it's like, if you get one point, then you get this certain amount of information. If you got zero points, you can get this different piece of information. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so right now, I'm gonna do a test because again, we haven't, I haven't had the opportunity to do this with like an actual group of students. So if you guys could go to your thing, you should see the question, but not this one, if you guys are students. Do you wanna see how it looks? Yeah. So it, it just says that it's locked, so it does let students know that there's more to come. Okay. Which is kind of nice, potentially, so you sound like, hey, look. So let me show you guys real quick. If you do, if you right now click on the yes or no, it's a quiz question. It's only got one point associated with it. And if you answer yes, then this other question should come up is essentially how it works. If you answer no, then the other question won't. Um, and from the back end, what I'll show you is that, so when you go in and you make your quiz, um, you can, uh, you'll see up at the top, you've got this Mastery Paths tab, and that tab is actually on like almost everything that you make. So if it's a quiz or if it's a page, you have the option to associate it with a Mastery Path. 
And this is something else that we that they sort of briefly talked about at the Canvas conference yesterday, which is uh, something that they're going to be developing this summer, so it's a little bit more robust. So right now it's a little bit weak because it it's just associated with points, um, which means that you have to associate something with their gradebook, which means that um, you know there has to be some point involved in it. The way that I figured out how to do this, or that I started using this, if you um, went through the quiz, you'll probably also have access to this link already. Um, it's called Hacking Mastery Paths. This is on their community page, and basically how this professor used it was she wanted to give their students, or her students, um, like two options of a book to read. And basically, if they selected Fahrenheit 451, then they would get um, these different assignments associated with that book. Versus if they had selected 1984, they would get these other assignments associated with it. So at this point, it is definitely like a very basic way to kind of separate um, your, your students, but it is still sort of like this branching method. And subsequently, what you could do, I mean, this is like one separation, but you could have it be, you know, this module then separates again, and then each of those modules can separate again. It's a lot of work at the front end, um, but, you know, it's kind of an option. Yeah? So Zach, what you're saying is students have to answer a question in order to release the content associated with their response. Exactly. Versus in D2L, where you could say, once the student has viewed this, or once the student <coughs> has responded to this discussion prompt, then this other stuff shows up. Correct. Okay, so that's the limitation of Canvas. That's yes, awesome. and the, the thing that they're going to be um, working on or developing, as far as I know, is that it's, they're trying to move it away from it being point related and moving it towards being outcome related. So like, you could have a multiple choice question of like four different things, and, it, and instead of having to associate it with like a single point, then it's you're associated uh, with an answer. So like you could answer like James, and then James would take you to a separate mastery path of like you get all of these other assignments. Does that kind of make sense? I know it's too, super. I just been a long time yeah. since I've taught a class. That's right. And there's another more simplistic, but a little less a little less robust uh, method, you could have a page. Uh, because Canvas content pages are essentially simplistic HTML pages. And if you remember those text, if anyone is old enough to remember the text-based computer games from the early 80s, it's like, you walk up to a mailbox. What do you do? I, I open the mailbox. I walk past the mailbox. So you could just have buttons. So, it, and then the buttons send you to a different page. So it's not as it's not collecting data on what the students pick, but you can you can do some simplistic paths uh, just with some basic tools. John, as you get more and more into Canvas, I really recommend looking at that page that uh, Zach brought up, the Canvas community. So can you just quickly show how to get there? Yes. And here's why: the Canvas community is a bunch of people not hired by Canvas, but people who use Canvas, and they want to figure out how to teach better with it. So these are instructors, these are instructional designers who are trying to figure out problems on their own. So in the Canvas course, you go to the help thing, you ask the community, and that'll bring you into this. You can log in. There are different groups there. Um, under join groups, we have a group at UW-Madison, the UW-Madison group that I'm just about to invite Zach to. I just followed him, so um, now that I know that he's there, I can see what he does and what things he adds to it. If you get onto this, join that group, and then I'll follow you. And then when you have questions, I can like keep track of what questions you have, and I can help you figure out how to answer those questions. Um, and then instead of just answering the question for you, we can put a post <coughs> on that community group space, and all of the other people who have the same question I don't have to answer the same question for them all individually because I could just say, oh, we just had this great question that Zach had. So I really recommend going there um, <coughs> as soon as you start getting comfortable. Yep. And uh, just a hint about finding things like Canvas community or how does Canvas do such and such. I've had much better luck just going to Google and typing things like Canvas quiz questions. 
than I ha than I've had searching in the search box in the Canvas community. You have to be Google is much more forgiving and lenient in interpreting your question and uh, trying to understand what you meant by it. And in the Canvas community, uh, there's a search box. You have to be more precise. So if you want to know what this Canvas do X, Google. Um, I've had much better luck that and way. Google will respond with answers from the Canvas community, yes. which helps you get to the Canvas community yes. page, the right page right away yes. better. Yes, that good. Is Good point. Yeah, that's the quickest way I've found to get to the Canvas community is to is to use Google. So you need to log in to Canvas to do that, right? Yeah. It's not available right now. Canvas stuff is spending to you. All right. Um we'll go back to uh we've got forty two minutes. Um oh and also uh before you leave we will ask you to fill out uh one page uh evaluation survey there's a box on there for comments and suggestions so if there's something you want to see more of if you'd like us to develop uh, to develop more work a workshop maybe around uh, going deeper into these mass into paths that could be a place to to give us that feedback um, so what what you might like to see more of um, so let's go back to the demo requests and or even the ten, the ten ideas I listed before. Okay, one of the easiest things to show, uh, which I hope is what what you meant by the question, uh, is about the calendar, uh, the Canvas calendar. My calendar might not look real interesting because I'm not in that many classes that have uh, dates assigned, but. So here's here's my Canvas home my home dashboard, and it's got uh, here's icons for all the Canvas courses or several of them that I'm associated with, and where is my calendar? Okay. So the one of the things Canvas does, uh, and this is a good distinction to make, this red navigation bar on the side is an aggregate uh, that affects your account and all of your courses. So things like when I go to the dashboard, there's many of my courses. When I'm in a course, there's this intermediate navigation bar that's only about this course. So this red one is global, the white one is, is particular. So one of the things that's global is the calendar and mine's not very interesting because I don't have things going on right now. But if, if I were a student and my instructors were using Canvas and they had created, let's say they created an assignment with the assignment page type and they had put dates on there. Like if you make an assignment, there'll be a box for due date and you can select a calendar from a calendar uh, interface, what date it's due. So then Canvas knows that. It knows that I am in English 101. It knows this assignment is due on February 17th. And then if I'm looking at my calendar, my calendar, here's my English assignment is due on the 17th. There'll be a little note. Oh, and my biology assignment 10 is due here. Um, so there's no extra work for you to do to make things show up on a calendar. If you've used one of the Canvas pages that has dates associated with it, they'll get pulled into the student calendar. Uh, and then as a student, if this is overwhelming for me, I can filter uh, by which calendars I want to see. So I can look just at my English calendar. I can look just at my biology calendar. Did that answer whoever wrote that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, one of the suggestions that they made yesterday about the calendar was to label it with your course number for students because otherwise they'll see everything here and if you say assignment one is due on the 16th and they have four other assignment ones due on the mm. 16th, they might not be able to differentiate them very easily. So right. if you say English 101 assignment one, it makes it really easy for them to figure out what's happening. That's a good point. Meaningful names uh, will go a long way. But where do you do that? Because you said at least that automatically. Yes. Okay. Let's when you create the assignment. Let's yeah, let's do that really quick. Um, so I'll go back to the How to Teach Effectively in Canvas course. And I'll go to my modules. 
uh, and I want an assignment in this module that we're working in. So there, an assignment, you choose what type of page. So I'm using the assignment type. It's a new assignment. Meaningful. So there, there it is in the module. And it's still not that meaningful because I didn't call it an assignment. But I would. But here's an editing box where I can do the same sort of things I can do in a content page. I got rich text editing. I can embed a video, an image, uh, things like that. And I'm just going to type garbage. Um, mm -hmm. It's worth. 10 points. Or you can attach a PDF file. Yes. Sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. Attach and then. Yep. Upload. Yep. The same things you can do in a content page, you can do here. Um, points. You're going to submit online. Uh, then you've got some options of, like, if you want to restrict file types, you can do that. And it's due tomorrow at 11.59 p.m. So because Canvas, once it has these page types and it organizes them, oh, and I need to publish it. Um, that's the thing that I would tend to forget is that I have to publish. So now I've published it. So now if I go to my calendar, or if I am the test student, in the calendar. Why aren't I seeing it? Do I have to give your check unchecked on how to teach effectively? I have so many courses. Oh, you wrote your course there course. it is. Okay, thank you. <laughs> right. Okay. So there's my meaningful name assignment. And so I click and get this and then I can see that's a thing and then I can click on it. To just say what what is that assignment? I thought it would have taken me there. Um, another nice thing about that is because Canvas talks to itself, is that if I've made an assignment and I've given it points and I've published it, it should show up in the gradebook. Um, so in D2L, as I understand, you had to make, you had to create your gradebook. Canvas will create the gradebook <coughs> for you based on the discussions and assignments that have, that have points associated. So if you use if you use the tools that Canvas makes available, there's aggregate, aggregation capabilities it does that then help communicate those uh, those to your students. So can you go to the grade? Oh. So right now it's yeah. not visible to students. Right. Visible. Right. I can see it, but but when you're, when you're teaching in Canvas, you, one of the choices you'd want to make is what do I want to make visible to students? And it's probably going to be things like the home page, the grades, and modules if you've used modules. <coughs> Can you select to show some things on the calendar and some to not show? You have to basically do it one at a time. Um, because maybe you're, you're creating assignments for the rest of the semester and you don't want to overwhelm the students, I think something like that. Um, if you don't publish them, but but I'd have to wonder why. I mean, if like, uh, do you want to communicate to the students what the trajectory is going to be of what kind of, of assignments are going to be due over over the course of the semester? Okay. Um, I haven't tested this, but I would think that if it's not published, it would show up in the calendar. Save it and not publish. I think, yeah, you can save it, not publish it. I think it would then not show up in the calendar. But I haven't tested that. There's a lot of nuances uh, that real, when as more people use Canvas in the ways you all want to use it, because all your courses will be different, we'll discover more of these these things. Those are, they're great questions. Um, but anyway, I was going to look for my meaningful assignment. Yeah, there's my meaningful name assignment. So I didn't have to make that, it just showed up. Um, 
Any other, what other demos can we do quickly? Sid, yes. I wonder if you go back to the calendar and click on edit instead of the course name, if that takes you directly to the assignment where you can say, oh shoot, that popped up on the wrong date. I want to change it quick. Okay. So if you hit the red edit. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was curious about. Yeah. So, uh, it's actually due today at 11.59. But that, it looks like that's the only thing that yeah, and I'm not in student view, uh, I'm, I'm still the instructor, so uh, student view is a very useful thing to know about in Canvas. <clears throat> So in D2L, uh, Learn at UW, you had some options to imitate a student. In Canvas, you do as well. It's not 100% perfect, but it's pretty good. Uh, so you get to that, <coughs> you go to settings, uh, and then there's a button called student view. And you get this magenta bar at the bottom uh, to, to let you know you're in student view. So this is where if you're if you want to make sure you've published everything you thought you published, or you notice that these these navigation links are gone now, um, I go to modules, and here's what students. Oh, and there's my yes or no question. So mm -hmm. I don't. I'm not even seeing <coughs> that That's second. Super one. Weird. That's strange. That's how it happened to me yesterday when I was testing it, and then it, and then when I you went into it. the student view, it, it didn't have it shown. Yeah. So it's not it's not 100 percent perfect, but no. it's it's got a lot of good aspects. Uh, and if you're a test student, I could I could submit an assignment. So I could go to the assignment, I could upload the file, mm -hmm. I could type in the text box, whatever, and then the grade book would show that test student has done something to that assignment. And then I could go back to being the teacher, and I could practice grading it and giving it feedback. And then I can go back to being the student and seeing what do the students, how do the students access this? So you can go through that path, and you can always reset the student if you want to try it again after you've made edits. So you mentioned test students. Um, are instructors able to create test students on their own? No, there is just the 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 one that you get. Um, I think you get, and if you do different sections, you get one for each section then. Ah, um, I, because I, I noticed as a teaching that. assistant, I had a test student in another ah. section, and other TAs did as well, and could see okay. their student groups. But I was always annoyed by it, because test student like, showed up the bottom of my grade book, but sometimes yeah. there were like three more students underneath it. Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't do anything to turn it off, but I'm like, <coughs> faculty can. You can, I don't know about teaching assistants. Teaching assistants are but positive cannot. Okay, you can, <laughs> you can make test student go away okay. out of your grade book. Well, there's a lot of people in here. Um, mm -hmm. I'd have to find test, there's yeah, test student. So I think it's always on the bottom. Okay. But it wasn't in all of my sections. So if I had students like last name John <laughs> or something, it would show up underneath. Oh, wait, I think it's somewhere. You can, you can simplify. If having test student there gets annoying after a while, you can make it go away. And then when you, if you go to student view again, it recreates test student. I, I did look this up once. I just don't remember okay. the exact step. So it might maybe just something to learn to ignore. Yeah. Learn to ignore, or uh, I think it's under sections, but I, it's been a long time since I did that. I know this test student is automatically created, is that what you're saying? Yes, if you, when you go to student view, um, it will create this test student who is a test student in your class or section. Um, so it's not, like a, it's not like one test student for all of campus, it's a test student in, in this class. So it, it takes a random student? No, no, no. It's just like a fake, a it's fake, happening. generic, nobody student. But it le helps you see what mo what's been published, what hasn't been published. You can go through the steps of, of uploading an assignment to see what it's like, uh, to, s to see where the feedback goes, to see what it's like when Canvas tells you you have a grade, uh, grade available. So it helps you uh, just get a little more insight into the student experience, what they see or don't see. But can the test students submit something? Yes. And you can see what they submit? Yeah. 
So you are the test you. student. You're the test student. student view. Whatever you do in student view would show up here. Yes. Yeah, we can we can do that because it's a pretty quick thing to do. So <coughs> settings, uh, settings is a good thing to get to know. There's some really useful things there, like what what mod what links you show to students or not student do or don't show to students. Um, being a student, a fake student. All right, so I'm the fake student, and I go to modules. Um, Name Where is meaningful name? It's up a little bit. Okay, thank you. Modules can also get really long and complicated if you've got a lot of content. Uh, something to be aware of. So there's, the, yeah, there's meaningful name. I got submit assignment. And there's my, there's my response. Um, I can even make a comment. This was hard. <coughs> my uh, internet's a little slow. Um, all right, so my assignment was successfully submitted. I can even resubmit. Um, so now I'm going to leave student view. So I'm not the I am not the test student now. I am the instructor now. Um, so let's say uh, I, I log back, I log into Canvas, uh, I'm on my dashboard. How did you leave the student view in the course? Um, in that magenta bar at the bottom, there was a button that said leave student view. So, um, so now I go to my how to teach effectively. Oh, and look, I, I've got a little to do thing here. Oh, grade meaningful name. Um, so I go to that, and there is one person who has submitted meaningful name. So there's there's my there's their assignment. I don't. Oh, there's their comment. This was hard. <laughs> and I say, did you read the book? <laughs> Can you participate in the pre-class activity to help you prepare for this assignment? Um, and their grade is zero. That's so bad. <laughs> um, okay. So now I now I'm back in the grades, and I should see that test student. Well, there it is now. Here's my meaningful name assignment, and test student has a zero. Now I go back to being test student, student view, got the magenta bar. Um, here is my, uh, my meaningful name assignment has been graded and I've gotten a zero. I clicked on the name and there's there's my comment, there's the instructor comment. Um, and then I could resubmit the assignment. And I could say, okay, if, if, if that's an acceptable uh, procedure, I could resubmit it and then I could comment again. It says, okay, I read the book, now I've, I've done better at such and such. And as the instructor grades that again, the, uh, the comment, the, there'll be a kind of a running comment. So you told student one, you really need to work on your grammar. And then student one resubmits. You told student seven, your argumentation is weak. Uh, so you can have that commentary of what you told people to work on. Ruth. Does the resubmit assignment show up only if you indicate it in the settings? Um, because I could see students really, if you don't want them to resubmit and that shows up as a possible, you know, as a thing, that could be very bad. That's a good question. I think you can anyone know? Even. Like you would say, you can have two submissions and three submissions. For, for, yeah. three, for each assignment? For each assignment. It, it archives them. So they can't overwrite their first assignment right. entirely. The only way I've really seen students do this is, oh shoot, I submitted the wrong one. And then they jump back in and resubmit the new one quick. 
I think it's probably easier for you to just leave it on because otherwise you're you're going to be dealing with emails from students like, can I go back in and resubmit this? I made a mistake. I don't think it. <coughs> We can put the all this with grade. They can get graded on one You point. pick which one to grade. So you can decide, well, I'm only going to grade the first assignment that you submit to me, or, the last or I'll grade the last assignment. And if both are completed by the due date, I mean, you get to make that decision, and then you can comment to the student which one you graded and why. So there's some options there. Yeah, I don't know either, but you do, you can track when students have resubmitted, and it does, as Allison said, archive the old ones, and it's a, it's going to be hard to see on the screen, um, but students, test students, uh, assignment is now turned yellow. Uh, so the turning yellow indicates to me that they have resubmitted. Um, so I could go into that. Yeah, if people treat that as a way that oh, I'm, I'll, I'll submit it and then see what grade I get, and then if I don't like it, I'll resubmit it and see, you know, so one would have to be very careful with instructions, and I find mm -hmm. students don't read instructions attentively or well. Okay. So I would rather shut off the button. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> does anyone know if the it's button can be shut off? Yeah. Um, as far as I know, it's not possible to turn it off. The control that you have is the date you can set when you can't submit anymore. Mm -hmm. Yes. You can shut the whole box down. Yeah, I, so I, I get it. It's just, I mean, there's lots of things I don't like that I have to live with. So <laughs> <laughs> Canvas treats assignments that have been submitted late, like how it displays them or indicates to me that it's been submitted late. Allison. Presuming you have the box open, they'll show up as like a light pink. So if you have the light yellow, it would be pink. Okay. So it's right. And in speed grader, it says this assignment was turned in late. Okay. okay. Can you comment to not accept it it's late? Does anyone know the answer? So, yeah, you can, shut, you can shut it by an end date because then the student wouldn't be able to submit a document. Right. But if you leave it open, they can submit it, but it will say late. And then you can just, if it's in your grade book, if it's red and that means it's late, you can just give them whatever score you give for late assignments. If it's a zero or a complete <coughs> or. Right. But yeah, when you're, when you're setting up the assignment, there's a, there's a, there are three date options, a due date, but then there's also an available from and until. And if you put an until date on there, that means that when the student goes to that assignment after that date, the button will no there's longer no be. Date. Actually, yeah. is, the, is the assignments, can they still it see gets. kind of the landing page of the assignment? The assignment is there, but the submit button is not, but the submit button is not there. So they got no button to push, they can't. Oh, so they cannot submit like that if you, if you don't allow them. If you mm -hmm. put that uh, yeah. until date, from yeah. and until. One of the things about this with uh, peer grading and grading with groups, having the students grade each other's, um, Canvas will automatically set up the groups about one minute after the due date. So even if you have it accepting grades beyond the due date, um, everybody, everybody who submits something beyond that will not be part of a group, will not get a papers to peer review, will not get their paper peer reviewed. That would be something you'd have to set up manually on your own if you want. All right, so we have time for probably one more demo. Um, there's some ideas here or on, on the handout of the things, uh, the 10 ideas. So if someone shouts something out. Uh, you said that the models get very long if you have a lot going on. 
that you have an option of organizing that, right? Oh, the modules. The yes. modules. Yes. yes. They, they can. All right. Um, so I'll go back to, we'll just look at, at this course. So here, uh, in this mod, by, this is, uh, so the modules are the containers, uh, and you can put links, documents and things in the container and in an order. So here's my examples for individual learning. And I've got that many examples, that's probably about 10, 15 at the most. So you can imagine if, if, my, if I were using Canvas heavily for a 15-week course and every week had five readings and two assignments and a discussion, that, that could get pretty long. Um, <clears throat> one thing I tried to do here, uh, just recognizing that this is long, uh, I'm trying to, and I only have one level of organizational structure. In D2L, you can have a folder within a folder. In Canvas modules, there's just a module and things in the module. You, you don't have that folder hierarchy. So I tried to simulate hierarchy. Um, you can think about how successful I am. Is that one of the things you can do <coughs> is this, this is just a text header. So I made a text header about contextualized content, because here's my examples about that. And here is my link uh, to a page that's got a YouTube video. I indented it under uh, contextualized content, and this one too. So that's my contextualized content chunk. Here's my facilitated engagement with content chunk. I could, I've, you've got a number of levels of indenting, uh, so you can make things kind of visually appear to be connected and ordered. Uh, and then these text headers can help. You can also do some uh, play with typography. So let's say I had made this all caps because it's, it's more of a meta category and I had lower, upper lowercase underneath it. Um, it's limited, but there are some things you can try to do. Peter. Uh, you know, it would have been nice to have a feature where you can expand or, or minimize it would. You yes. know, one heading thing. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and so, th so there's no tool in Canvas that can accomplish that? What you can do, John, would this be an opportunity to go to the Canvas community and ask for what you want? <laughs> uh, you can do that. Can. Also, consider um, using Canvas style guides um, for pages. You can do that kind of expansion and such in, pa in, 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 in pages. For Canvas this is, that was possibly the very first thing I ever submitted to the Canvas community when I started, because that was a very common question. And they said that uh, they'd known about it, it's been commonly requested, but their their response was um, the accessibility readers. Mm -hmm. Anytime you start creating that layer of, com of complexity where things are collapsing and disappearing, it, they're, they're, the primary response to me is those, those readers, those screen readers, go bonkers with that sort of stuff. And so they, mm -hmm. they just don't. Right, so and, and, and it's not on the radar to do it. Yeah. So. so you can collapse the modules. Yeah, yeah, he, he yeah. just wants collapsing within the modules, kind of ah, the old got modules it. within modules kind of sure. thing. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I guess you could, you could unpublish yeah. stuff when you're done with it. Yeah, um, or, or sometimes what, what people do is that you can use page, uh, a page of links instead mm -hmm. of like in the module, it's like link, 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 link. You could have one page, it's like here is the week one overview page and then link to the assignment, link to the reading about such and such, but then don't, and make those pages with the embedded content and the meaningful stuff uh, published, but don't put them in the module view. So you can have pages uh, under pages and you can have the pages available, but don't put them here. Uh, make a page that says, here is all the stuff you need for week one. And then use that page like an HTML, a little web page that just, and just make links to the meaningful content. And then that goes back to John's suggestion that if you go that route, and if you're willing, to, if you are interested and you want to get in that, some of the richer HTML fun, there's some great mm -hmm. style guides that, that have these accordions that will provide that collapsing. 
click on it, ooh, it opens up, yeah. flaps it, click it, ooh, it opens up. The other advantage of that is that way you can provide context rather than just what's in the title of the page. Yeah. yeah. yeah right. So you can say, yeah. first, take a look at yes or no link mm -hmm. and answer the following question, da 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 check out this video link, mm -hmm. you know, and that, those are the signposts yeah. that the students look for so they don't get lost. The page system here, if you have pages published and shown, and even the root of the modules, can get very confusing. And if your nomenclature, if your naming system is not really good, it can get very confusing to you as well. Mm -hmm. um, Could you put an example of that accordion style variant in here to, to look at? Sure, she just had it open. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, style, okay, that what everything John said is true, and it's it's a little more work for you. It is. Set up. It, it requires going into the HTML editor. Right. Um, style guys. I had it, where is it? Ah, all right, so again, I used Google, and I searched for Canvas style guide. There you go. And it got me here. And what this is, it's snippets of HTML code that do some of these nicer things uh, in Canvas, like here. Here I can make sections. Um, so there's an example, here's the code. And so you can do more, more aesthetically pleasing, fancier, more organization things, but it does require that you copy and paste HTML code, and if it doesn't work, that you troubleshoot it. So there's more risk. There's some of these that I've tried and I just copied and pasted the HTML. It didn't work and I said to heck with it. Um, I'm not doing that right now. Um, so it's, I mean, you can get more, but it re requires more of you as well. Or if you have a TA who can help. Uh, and if you have a TA that can help, make sure that next year you also have a TA who can help. And right. the year after that you have a TA that can help or you'll have to learn it yourself. Right. Or, or you're going to have really yeah. complicated pages. <laughs> you better. In five years, you're going to wake up and you're going to be like, uh oh, right. my TA left. And or, I don't or, know what yeah. now. or if you're in a school or department that is investing in having support staff available and, and making like some kind of common pages, uh, that can help. So, again, it's, it's kind of like thinking about what you need, what you can get, and what you're able to maintain over time. But here's the good news. All of the national pushes to learn to code, this is a great way to start because it's pretty easy. And you can do it too. Right. Um, it was Karen or Julie on your, on your, that you used tabs. Which that was fine. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I did one too. Okay. Um, oh, good. Julius. So after the session, we're going to make this link here be the, the Teaching Effectively in Canvas homepage. Um, we'll go, so go to Karen's example. So Karen uh, used, used this tab structure here. And I did the linking approach that you were mentioning. I, ha I actually originally had it set up in modules, but I didn't like its flow and it was just too much mm -hmm. mess. So that's why I went with this approach instead. Right. And I chose not to take the time to do that. One of the best examples, or first, well, let's say first examples that I've seen of this was uh, Miguel Garcia Gasalvis in business uses the tabs across the top of his syllabus page. So the syllabus page, I think traditionally I understand syllabus to be like the course documents, you've got expectations there, you've got um, the policies and all these other different things across there. In Canvas, the syllabus is primarily a course schedule. So every, every assignment that you have in there shows up automatically in the syllabus with its due date, by due date, arranged by due date. Above that, there's room to add some text. If you add all of your course policy documents in text form there, above that, the students will never get to the course schedule. They will never see it. So in order to minimize that, he has four tabs across the top, one of them is course schedule, and that's the basic syllabus. And another one is um, policies, and that goes to another page that has all of his course policies on there, et cetera, et cetera. So he's got, I think, three, four tabs across the top and arranged it that way. 
And the tabs were from HTML code or how they? And the tabs are directly from that style guide, Canvas style guide. It's pretty easy to, you've got to dig into HTML, but it's, it's pretty easy. I think the tabs for me were the most user friendly. The buttons, I drive me crazy. Mm. Um, yeah, but, but the tabs were pretty mm. friendly. <laughs> all right, and we're learning more about all, all about Canvas and what it can do all the time. I mean, a number of people have mentioned things they learned at a at a Canvas gathering yesterday. So it's like this is hot off the press, new to us too. Uh, so we're all a lot of so we're we're learning this together. Uh, and it's different from Desire to Learn. Desire to Learn was updated once a year in June after the students are gone and tested all summer and then hopefully worked well for the rest of the year. Canvas sends out updates every two weeks. So there are changes every two weeks and some that we have to keep track of and try to learn. Right. And, and that's good because you don't have to wait until next year to have these great features. On the other hand, it looks a little bit different. Right. So one example, and this is also where we have opportunities to influence uh, some of some of the features. One example is uh, when we first when we first became acquainted with Canvas, the default was that your course showed up with this randomly selected colored box on the dashboard, and John was someone who advocated for being able to put in pictures. Um, it took the overlay off. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then just read. Yesterday. Then, yeah. I think it was last week. Um, but so up until last week, the picture still had this colored overlay, and I, which I had to make transparent as transparent as possible, and it, and it still made the picture as hard to see. And now a more recent update is that you can make the overlay go away. Well, so it has a color on it, what? Mine uh, too. But then it'll color the type. Um, so this is something you could do. It, again, there's a thing in settings where you can put a, some kind of meaningful picture uh, for your for your students to help them find your course in this Canvas dashboard. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of something that we, as John in particular, really influenced being able to do that. Uh -huh. so is that the overlay something that is only controlled on the instructor side? Or if a student is having difficulty with the overlay, can they turn it off? It is only at the user level. Oh, okay. Unfortunately. So as an instructor, you can put a very, very colorful picture on it, and all of your students may have an overlay over that, and so they can't see that picture. Unless you go in and say, hey, if you want to take that pink off, that pink tint off of everything, um, you have to show them how to do that. And I don't know how to do that. I'm trying to figure it out right now. Go to the gear. Up. Okay. That's the last ah, demo. John, we are, the we are gear to the top problem. right of those cards. Uh, we have a number of consultants here. We can hang out uh, after, the afterwards, afterwards, but we don't want to honor No, the gear the uh, on the header line, that dashboard line, one level of the dashboard. Um, and then so you have color overlay. Got it. I keep looking at the screen behind you, and I have to keep Force reminding detail. myself that's uh, not you. But the reason for the color is you go to the calendar, all of your courses, and you go in there, you can see on the calendar the color of the... Right. right. So the right students can color code it themselves. Yeah. Exactly. Right. right. Yeah. I don't know if you take off the overlay, I would assume they still have this color. Yeah, they're still colored. They're still yeah. colored. Yeah. yeah. And that is why it took so long for them to get to this point. That was last March I advocated for the, mm -hmm. right. for the picture. and. In May they changed it, but I was amazed how quickly they moved. Yeah, they don't always move that fast. Right. So if I wanted to change the image, which I'm not really going to, I could choose a uh, upload an image from my computer. You'd want it to be the right aspect ratio, or you can go search in Flickr, uh, which is. So I don't really want to do that, but that's, and especially if you're teaching a course that's named something like special topics. Like English 800, special topics. Um, that's the word, that, that's what's going to show up in the dashboard. You can make an image that says special topics. Mm -hmm. Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See if you can find an image of Shakespeare. I dare you. <laughs> I just All wanted right. to wrap up really quick. I, um, I played with the uh, assignment resubmit button that we were talking about. It won't bother the instructor at all. If they resubmit something, it just completely gets rid of their old submission. So 
so you don't see any of that. There's no like you don't have to sift through okay. ten submissions. It's just it's just a drop down box. You can get at them, but they're not the one that's it's right. Not the the most recent one stays like that's the one that that's the one that yeah. pops up in the speed grader. Right. right. Yeah. And it, there's speed a drop down grader. box for other submissions. So right. if you really want to dig into their own you submissions, can. you can. You can. Yeah. But you can no. ignore it. Yeah. No, my my point was so if if a student wants me to look at a draft of their essay, I'm glad to do that. But yeah. I want them to email and do that. Um, personally with me instead of treating me like a driving mm -hmm. service. Sure. <laughs> so yeah. that's my goal is personal connection. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. So so we've had some really great questions and, and hopefully we've done enough demos to, to get some of your uh, uh, some of your interest. There's there's only so much time and there's only so much we can do. 